welcome to 15 Minutes with Chariot Solutions. Today I'm talking with Andrew Gannam, who has spent the last year or so working with a large multinational consumer products company uh, with their data science team helping to build the data pipeline and data lake that they use to analyze their data. With that, I'm going to turn it over to Andrew and uh, please tell us more about the project and what you were doing. Uh, sure, Keith. So um, when they brought me in, the there's a data analytics team basically running some machine learning models in GCP uh, using Kubeflow and Kubernetes. And they had the, most of the company's stacks actually in AWS. And so there's some data pipelines already in place to move data out of a data lake um, that was you know, largely parquet files on S3 with Hive on top of them and move that over into GCP. Uh, but the, those pipelines have been put in place by the analytics team. Um, and there were some inefficiencies. Some of those steps ran really slow. There were also a number of data sets that they needed to bring over for their models that they you know, didn't, didn't have uh, in place. So they brought me in to basically clean up what was there and bring in a whole bunch uh, of new data. So the cleanup, when we had talked about this before, seemed to be by far the largest part of the project. Uh, I know you had mentioned <laughs> Well, that, yeah, uh, so there's, there's two aspects to that cleanup. One was cleaning up the pipeline code itself. Um, and the, so the pipelines were designed using a tool, an automation tool called Airflow, which was originally built by Airbnb. It's uh, open source now. I assume Airbnb still uses it. Um, and the Airflow jobs essentially spin up EMR clusters and run PySpark jobs on them that go and pull data out of the data lake, manipulate it, uh, write it out to S3 to a, like an export bucket. And then that data gets picked up by a separate process running GCP. Um, so there's a lot of cleanup of that code that was needed, but then there's also a lot of cleanup just of, of the data that's coming in. Um, essentially, you know, the ML pipeline uh, in GCP was doing some cleanup that really should be pushed upstream into the, into the extraction job. And so a lot of what it did was sort of looking at across different input data sources and cleaning up data. You know, you might have consumer transaction data purchases of products coming from different platforms and you know, the, the fields present to some extent would align, but in a lot of cases would be very different. So um, restructuring that data, you know, essentially cleaning it all up so that you could join it and aggregate across it. Right. I remember you had called out a couple of the issues with that, such as how data from bricks and mortar stores would be very different from data from online sales. Yeah. So the, the, the models, when I started on the project, the models were only taking in digital transaction data um, from, I believe, two of their uh, two sources. But that, at that point, the data had all landed in the data lake in one table and it, you know, it was essentially one source as far as the models were concerned. And one of the first things that I did was bring in the brick and mortar sales data. Um, and there were a number of things that were different about that data. For one thing, there were, there were records that appeared in both data sets. Uh, so you could go into a store, a brick and mortar store and purchase a product. But then if they didn't have the size that you wanted in store, that could be fulfilled through the online distribution. And so that would show up in both in both places. Um, so we needed to make sure we didn't bring those in. And then there was a similar, but kind of the, the inverse of that is that you could order a product online and go pick that up at a store. Um, and so those would also show up in both places. The records look different in each case, but you needed to make sure that you didn't double count you know, those sales. You didn't want to be picking them up as digital transactions and then also as brick and mortar transactions. And um, you know, essentially assuming that the, the consumer had bought that product twice. So, um, you know, identifying those records, which as you might expect, there was nothing about in the data dictionaries for the data sets. Uh, it's just kind of look, look through, uh, you know, find some anomalies and go, I think there's something going on here and kind of start cross-referencing the data sets. Um, another thing, there are a number of flags in the digital data that don't appear in the brick and mortar data. Um, so things like clearance indicator may or may not be present depending on where the product's coming from. There are actually more channels besides those two, there are, there are different channels in different countries and there's different channels, even in North America, they have a couple of different ways of selling. Um, and so clearance indicator is one that was, what was particular interest, particularly interesting because the, uh, the models, one of the things that the models would try and do was analyze consumer behavior and they would look for whether uh, a buyer was price sensitive or not. So being able to identify consumers that are always buying items on clearance was something that was valuable. So some of the sources didn't have that we could try and synthesize it by like going and looking at msrp and then the actual purchase price and you could say okay well if they bought it for 40 percent below purchase price then that's basically clearance 
uh, so you could do things like that. Uh, one, one that I thought was kind of amusing was in the brick and mortar data, you would have one line item, basically the, the data would look like your receipt from the store. So if the, if the cashier scanned three pairs of identical socks, you would have, you know, socks, socks, socks. Uh, if they hit quantity three and then scanned the socks, you would have a single line item with socks quantity three. The digital data never looked like that. It would always just be a single line item with a quantity. So, you know, you had to look for things like that in the brick and mortar data where you could make an assumption that one line item in the digital data corresponded to any, to any given product. You couldn't make those assumptions in the brick and mortar data. So it seems to me that a lot of this was looking for edge cases. Did that end up making the code really messy? Uh, and did you have any techniques for trying to clear that, clean that out? Um, so some of that was messy in the code when I, when I got there in that there, the, all of the export jobs that were in place uh, when I got there were straight dumps of the data from the data lake. And there was actually a lot of code duplication around like EMR cluster config, uh, setup and teardown, all that, all of that, all of the setup and teardown code in each of the Airflow jobs was basically just copy and paste from, from the other jobs. Um, and then because they were essentially just exporting tables out of a data lake and importing them into BigQuery over in GCP and then doing all their analysis there, uh, there was a lot of logic over on the GCP side um, built into views, mostly views in BigQuery. There's this very complicated stack of views when I, when I started um, where they were sort of doing things like, you know, populating null values, stuff that you could do in the, in the extraction job if you, you know, if you thought to do it there. Uh, and so a lot of what I did work on was pushing logic like that upstream into the extract job so that by the time the data, you know, landed in BigQuery, it looked exactly like the models wanted it. Um, which also meant bringing less data across and you're paying for, you know, import export uh, costs for data volume in both the Amazon side and the Google side. So uh, that, that was an interesting question. That's always been one of the things that has concerned me about Amazon is, you know, everybody thinks about the costs of their EC2 instances and their storage in S3, but never think about the nine cents per gigabyte that it costs to pull S3 data down to your laptop or move it somewhere else. What yeah. size data are we talking about? Well, so um, we really were dealing with two different types of data, what I've been calling transaction data, which is like, you know, purchases essentially across different platforms. Um, and then also activity data, which could be um, user clickstream data coming out of mobile apps or, uh, you know, web websites, uh, as well as other, other forms of user activity data. And, uh, in North America, the transaction data was somewhere around, I want to say 30, 30 to 40 million rows, uh, and, and growing because that's, you know, every time somebody buys something, you're getting, you're getting more data in there. That's, and that's just the single transactions table. So then there are other supplemental tables, product data, you know, all the tables in, in the data lake that you'd need to join to, but ten, on the order of tens of millions of rows. Um, and those tables are probably about a hundred columns wide, although we didn't pull all that down. So you're looking at uh, tens to low hundreds of gigs on some of those data sets. And then um, the activity data could be very large. So the, the activity data coming off of their main website was um, you know billions and billions of rows and hundreds hundreds of gigs if not larger terabyte um, scale yeah. yeah and there were there and were a couple of data sets that are that size mostly the data sets were you know tens of gigs uh, tens of millions of rows on, on on that scale and we pull in probably forty or fifty tables all told uh, so, so how a significant amount of data you know yeah. not not absolutely massive, but significant to be pulling down every single day and running models off of. Okay, so you basically are, are pulling the entire data set every day. Uh, in this case, yeah. The, they're, so in their AWS infrastructure, they have a streaming, uh, they, have, they have some streaming infrastructure set up that could be used to do some of this work. But the team that I was working with, all of their models run in GCP, and there's some reluctance, corporate reluctance, to merge the two stacks. They really didn't want to have AWS keys being stored anywhere in GCP or GCP keys stored anywhere in AWS. So uh, we used a collection of S3 buckets as essentially a import export landing area. And we would just move data back and forth that way. So because also there was a, there's an import side to all of this where once the models were run, the models were generating features around consumer behavior and those features needed to get back 
over into the data lake to be used by other teams within the company. So uh, there's a, a separate workflow that brought data back. Yeah. Uh, one thing we had talked about earlier is, especially with uh, multinational, a multinational business and data coming from various places, that you were affected by different privacy laws in each Absolutely. of those places. Yeah, so, uh, you know, things like GDPR in the EU, um, in, here in the US, California has its own set of privacy restrictions and other geos have their own privacy laws. Um, wherever it was possible, we would apply the most strict uh, privacy ruling to all of the data, which I actually thought was kind of commendable on their part, but it gets very, it gets very complicated. Like you, you may be able to use a particular record to train a model, but, um, but not to actually run through the model for the purposes of generating a feature about a particular consumer. So, you, you know, you may be able to use it for training, but not for marketing. Um, well, that's and actually, different, sorry? That's, that's really interesting. Sorry to interrupt, but. Yeah, um, yeah, you have to keep, and you have to keep track of that stuff as well. The, the um, question I would have though is, does that make the models worse given that they might depend on data that isn't available when you run through them? So it, it would be less that you could use a particular feature of an individual, uh, which I think would, would be a problem like you're describing, uh, and more that you wouldn't be able to use a particular individual's data at all. Um, okay. So, you know, that could still cause problems. You may not have a representative, you may not be training on a representative data set at that point. Um, but I, you know, I didn't actually build the models and run the models. I kind of fed, fed them. So the, uh, the analysts were ultimately responsible for deciding whether they wanted to use a particular data set or not. But uh, the other piece of that that was, I think, even more complicated is around user uh, information deletion. So most countries have some process through which a user's data can either uh, sort of expire if the user's been inactive in your particular realm for a year or two years or five years or whatever it is, uh, or if they specifically request that you delete all of their information, then you have a, a limited time period in which to do that. And because of this export from AWS and import into GCP, that was you know, made even more complicated. The data may get deleted from the data lake. And then when we run our update job, because we're pulling down essentially complete copies or subsets that contain the data we cared about, we would lose those records that had been deleted. But then any derivative tables that were used by the models downstream would need to separately be pruned. So there is a, um, a subscription-based service where essentially when deletion requests came in, they would be broadcast and we would listen to that and then go ahead and prune that information out. Um, so. That's actually, with large data, I know one thing that ran into on a different project was a certain, I will not mention any names, a certain company that manages data and produces tools to manage data was very proud about being able to roll back to any point in time because they layered their data models uh, so that new data would simply be layered on top of the old and a deletion didn't actually delete the underlying data and it seemed like they didn't quite understand that. Did you run into issues like that where you thought something would be deleted and then realized, no, legally it, we needed to really delete it? Yeah, so you can, you can design your tables such that um, you know, you're, you're essentially uh, expiring records and in an append only manner, appending new records with date stamps on them, you know, to represent what the current state of that data is. In that case, you aren't deleting data and it's, it does not adhere to the legal requirements around uh, data, data deletion in GPR, for example. You actually have to go and remove all that data from your system. So um, this company didn't, didn't do that. They actually would just track the you know, the information as it came in and they would go and delete the record. If you are doing things that way, you can still go and have a sort of like a real delete versus a logical delete. Right. The only trigger in certain cases. Um, the kind of odd issue here that we ran into was that in uh, on the GCP side, all the data is in BigQuery. And when you issue a delete against a BigQuery table, it scans the whole table and you pay in BigQuery for like the volume of data scan. that your query references. Yes. So, so, you know, when they have a system that subscribes to single messages and every time one comes in, it goes and issues a delete against a you know, multi-billion row table, you're, you're paying a lot of money to prune very, very, very few records over time. Um, so one of the things that I, that I did while I was there was uh, revisit that and partition the data um, such that when those records come in, first of all, we, we would batch them. And then when those records came in, we would issue a query 
selecting only a very small, so what you can do in BigQuery is you can select a very small number of fields and then you're only paying for the, the data volume for those fields. But if you issue a delete, it hits all the columns. And so you pay for the whole partition that you're hitting. And the tables in this before weren't partitioned at all. So um, basically we partitioned them such that we could issue a query to determine which partition needed to be deleted from. And then within that batch, we would take all the records that came from a given partition and issue a delete against that partition for those records and so on for the other records in the batch. And that cut the scan volume down by a factor of like a thousand. It was a huge, wow. huge reduction. Uh, yeah, so were your partitions uh, vertical partitions through different, I'm not familiar with BigQuery, vertical partitions through different sets of fields or horizontal uh, through different sets of rows and partitions? So uncharted? they were uh, essentially on an addition, we added a date column that was a synthesized date okay. because at the time that we started that effort, uh, BigQuery only supported partitioning on date columns. They've since added support for uh, I believe just partitioning on integer columns. You may also be able to partition on strings now finally, but they, they didn't allow that uh, until somewhat recently. And so for all the transaction data and the activity data, there, there were dates kind of inherent in it. Um, but what we would try and do is look at the earliest date for a particular consumer for, for whatever table it was. And then we would use that as their partition date so that we could hit, so that all we could be sure that all of the data for a given consumer landed in the same partition. In that case, um, normally you would want to partition the data based on like the date of a given activity. For example, if you want to look at, you know, who was doing something yesterday, who was doing something three days ago. But if we took that approach, then the data would have been for a given individual would have been scattered across a whole bunch of partitions and it wouldn't have helped us in this deletion scenario. In the right. deletion scenario, we wanted to make sure that all of the consumer data was in a single partition. So we only had to scan one. And so we would, we would batch them based on the first activity date. In that, in that case, some different tables we would use different dates. Um, if there wasn't a date for that particular data set, we would generally then just join to some other data set to grab maybe their registration date, for example, um, and partition them based on that. Okay. So it, it was very specific to this to this deletion scenario where, you know, deletes were wildly more expensive <laughs> in BigQuery than they should have been. Well, but it, it's also an interesting approach in general of instead of distributing data strictly by whatever user identifier you have, um, to combine that with a date so that you kind of batch up, even if they have multiple interactions. You yeah, this was together. working around a limitation of BigQuery's partitioning, which at the time was only supporting date columns. Um, if they had just supported an outright string, we would have, we would have just partitioned on ID on range. Uh, although IDs are kind of messy in and of themselves. There were different IDs from different geos, and I mean, there, there were probably a dozen IDs across the data set. Okay. Different geos where being the data was geographic locations, right? Yeah, uh, yeah, sorry. Subsidiaries. Okay. Well, we're getting close to 15 minutes. So is there anything um, that you'd like to say that I haven't asked a question about? Um, I don't think I actually talked about the, the underlying tech. Most of the, so Airflow is a, is a Python uh, based, essentially a pipeline configuration tool, although your pipelines end up being uh, short Python code programs. Um, and in this case, the, that code basically had some configuration for an EMR cluster that it would spin up. It would then send notifications out to Slack, uh, you know, indicating the process of prog progress of different pipelines. If errors happen, you know, if we had a Slack channel that I could send error messages to directly from the pipeline. Um, and then the main step that would get kicked off was a PySpark job. So this was all Python um, over in the Airflow side. Because of the reluctance to sort of merge the two stacks, uh, on the GCP side, it was a lot of bash script and bash script run by a cron, uh, although kubeflow was used to run the machine learning models. So there, there's sort of a couple of different moving pieces. Okay, a lot of, yeah, a lot of different technology to all make work together. Yeah, exactly. All right, well, thank you for your time talking today. Um, to those who are watching this video, Chariot Solutions uh, is an application development consulting firm and would love to hear from you. Thank you.